Thank you for having this meeting. You've been good to me. You're a good son. I know there's others here, and of course I know these preachers are mine too, and I'm with them. They probably some believers with, with you, with you. I love you. You've been good to me. If, uh, I'll talk to this church here just because we're in the building. Don't. If you ever were to question whether the McMichaels practice what they preach. Let me set the record for you. They give, they tithe, they live what they preach. I am a witness that they honor their people of honor. The devil wants to work, especially right now. If you're, right now, if you're Jewish or if you're a Christian, you're on the hit list. Of both Satan and it seems even humans, many, many humans. And to live out your Christianity is a, is a great accomplishment. It, requ- it, it, it actually demands a great reward. God said, I am a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Isn't that right? And, uh, and so I wanted to thank the church here, first of all, for being who you are. You're always standing with me. Your pastor is always helping me. He serves on one of my most powerful international boards and uh, helps me that way. And, you know, he's a missionary. You know that. He's a pastor. He's your pastor. And uh, I like him because he's a visionary. Oh, I'd love him either way. (laughs) But I don't know if I'd like you if you were a coward and a sissy and and afraid to do what God said, amen. I wanted to, I wanted to, I'll just illustrate what I'm talking about. Where's my uh, stuff here? Yeah? Between the two Barclays, you're going to get it. Yeah, we'll get it. Right I want to show you something. This is your pastor's new book. Yeah. This is mine. It's like, <laughs> I thought this was cool until I saw this. I thought, this is just a track, man. This ain't no book. Are you kidding me? Then I thought, well, probably I'm so seasoned. It, I can get things done a whole lot quicker than this. So, uh, <laughs> show off. So when he brought me one of these and gave it to me, I knew, it, I knew what he was doing, of course, because I'd call up here every so often and say, do you and the team need me to come and bring some oxygen? Because <laughs> this, what is this, like a three and a half year project or something? And so he gave it to me and I looked at it, you know, and it's a powerful work. And I thought, well, I'll, you know, I'm, that's a big book. I mean, if I travel with it, you know, we'll have to weight and balance the aircraft, first of all. <laughs> So I told Pastor Chris, I opened it up and I started, I thought, well, I'm going to read the table of contents. You know, that's like 21 pages <laughs> or something. And then, uh, then I got reading the first, like, I don't know, I, how when did you give this to me? A few months ago or whenever it first came out? First of, first of September. So I've been looking at it and I've been giving it some good time and I'm through about that much of it. And I thought, every time I read a page, I thought, I didn't know that. I read another chapter about some kind of plant (laughs) or tree, and I say, I didn't know that either. (laughs) Another chapter, I surely didn't know that. There's stuff in here I didn't even know God created. But thank you. What a powerful work. You know what I'm praying over this, though? Now, I'm praying it for the body of Christ. Preachers need this because, I mean, I've been studying the Bible since the 70s, and I went to formal Bible college. And uh, this is some work you did, son. But I'm praying it gets in the universities. Can you, can you pray with that? That's where it really needs to go. It does. Because uh, there are people who will study this and use it, you know, towards degrees and in classrooms. And it's all connected to God. 
This is like a Trojan horse <laughs> galloping in the heart of the heathen. Raise a hand up here. Father, may this great work make it to the colleges and make it to the universities and make it into the right hands. All this work was not done just because it, it was fun or not done because it was a project and it will never be written that it was done in vain. No, nope, no, nope, you're going to use it. That's why you wanted it written. That's why you chose him to write it. And we agree together, don't we, church? Yes. We agree together in the name of Jesus that it's going to happen. Praise God. Amen. Let me ask you something. How are you doing living in the last days? Bless? Interesting, isn't it? Yes, sir. Interesting. A senator called me and said, what do you think, Doc, about what's going on in the Middle East right now? I said, war. Yes, sir. He laughed like you did, of course. I said, God, Jesus said there'd be wars and rumors of wars while wars are going on. This is just the beginning of the end of wars. He goes, really? Well, like, uh, you know, as a preacher and, and a prophet, huh, what do you feel about that? And I said, it's exhilarating to see the Bible unfold and come to pass. Technicolor, live feed right before our very eyes and there ain't a thing a sinner a pagan there ain't a thing a Philistine or an Amalekite can do about it God is unfolding it man and it's happening right now right in the midst of us Woohoo! praise God hallelujah yeah yeah and I just got my ear tuned to the trumpet it's going to be loud. You don't have to really, is that it? Is that it? I wonder if that, no, it's going to be loud. What, right? And the shout from heaven, the archangel, the trump of God, this is big business, man. Amen? Now on the way up, I confess that every ounce of fat still left on my body will fall like plops and plumps on every sinner looking up like, where are they going? And just splat and hit and... Praise God. And I'll get in my new heavenly glorified body. Huh? Just look at me now. Imagine. <laughs> I can't even finish that. <laughs> All right, look at Manda now. Wait till you see her in her heavenly glorified body. Woo! Yeah, you just won't be married, will you? Well, you didn't too, do too bad in the natural, so just shut up about it, will you? <laughs> Raise your hands to heaven and say, Jesus, I'm ready. Jesus, I'm going to stay ready. I'm going to help my pastor get everybody else ready. We know you're coming soon. And very soon, we're going to see the king. That's exciting. Clap once or something. That's exciting to me. Praise God. I am excited about it. Hallelujah. Uh, you're going to need three friends, maybe more, but you're going to need three very close friends if you're going to make it through the maze of the last days. Now, because some of you might not know, I'm even going to tell you who those three friends better be. Now, first of all, Let's talk about a maze. Best way I know how to explain it. When I was a little guy, we, the biggest event ever happened, uh, you've been to my home area, biggest event that ever happened was the county fair. That's a big deal. It wasn't because it's a little dinky village. But to us, oh man. And, you know, they have food there and they have rides there. But they have these big trailer things, you know. And I don't know, they, one was a haunted house and one was a... But one was called The Maze. And you'd pay money to go in the door and then you'd have to walk through this big thing and find your way. And, oh, man, us kids, three, I had two, two or three buddies. We bumped into... Because there's walls to stop you. Yeah. Then there's deceiving mirrors. Yeah. And we, man, we'd, get, we'd spend a half hour 
Pastor Chris. We'd get in there and then we'd all start yelling, help, help us. We're lost. And we'd turn around, bump into it, and then we'd turn, and then get bump into each other. We couldn't do it. But the, we'd yell long enough and the, the operator man would come and he'd walk up and he said, are you boys in trouble? I always felt like saying, no joke, Sherlock. What do you think I'm doing in here yelling like this? But my mama, those were the days mama used soap for clothes and your mouth. I chewed on more lava soap. If I even smell lava soap, I don't even allow lava soap in my hot rod shop. And I think that's half what it's made for. Are you kidding me? So I said, yes, sir, we're, we can't get out of here. He goes, oh, hook on right here. Hang on to my coat. And you hang on to each other. And you know that guy, he'd walk right through and get right out that other door. He never bumped into one wall. You know why? He knew where to go. Yeah. Not, one, not one of those mirrors fooled him. There was a, it didn't take long. It wasn't like a mile long thing. But... Yeah. He'd run into those mirrors and he'd turn right into it almost. And I, as a kid, I'd almost say, no, 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 don't do that. We already bumped into that. And he'd walk right down the hallway. What's your point, Doc? The Holy Spirit is going to help us and walk us through the maze of the last days. Because yeah. yeah. right now, between the bad doctrine, the heresy, the oh, dirt, yeah. the filth, the lies, oh, the backslidden, the departure from the faith, uh, we're like living in a maze. And the Holy Spirit wants to help you and me not to keep bumping up against the wall or fall for any of this trickery, all these fake like mirrors, you know, and things. And I believe that with all my heart. I just want to exhort you a minute. I know, uh, I know the pastor's here, of course, and so I know you're well taught. You might be visiting, and if you're looking for a church, shake hands with one of these preachers up here before you leave here tonight. There, you don't want to be without a church right now. No. I'm just telling you, the warfare's tough. Yeah. I ran, as a young Marine, I ran missions off from a, an attack aircraft carrier. Uh, and so we learned something really quick. The old master sergeant said, I got something to tell you, jarheads. Yes, sir. This thing's going to get a rocking and reeling. One time we went through a typhoon. That's like an angry hurricane. <laughs> that, that, that aircraft carry was like three football fields long. I don't know. I can't remember. 16 stories above the water. Airplanes everywhere. They, they chained them down. That typhoon had that carrier going like this into the water, out of the water, into the water. And the tin cans, that's a nickname for destroyers, smaller ships, they were disappearing. They come out of that typhoon wave and just hit it again and just totally disappear into the water. And then the buoyancy would bring them out. And he'd say, now, when this thing gets to reeling and rocking, it'd be a good idea for you not to jump ship. Because if the ship's going to go through this kind of, then you don't want to try swimming home. Amen. Now, you know, that's a lot of years ago. That's back in the 70s. I keep thinking about that, Ginger. How many Christians, the whole church is being shaken everywhere. It's the wildest time, and we got people jumping ship. They're just bailing out, going out on their own. Like, really? You're, you're, <laughs> the whole church, and I don't mean it's unstable. I mean it's in the storm. The whole church, you know, is, it, it, and, and you're just going to, what? Jump off? But I'm out of here. Where are you going? Amen. That's why, I, where are you going? Amen. Well, I don't know, but I can't do this anymore. Wow. Reminds me of that. This lady went to our church and one day after the altar, she grabbed me and she said, now, Pastor, I just want you to know that I, I, I'm all done. I can't do this anymore. I said, do what? <laughs> what? What do are you talking about? Do what? You know what I'm talking about? You know, this Christian stuff. I love Jesus. But the warfare is so hard. I just can't do this anymore. I said, yeah, you can. No, I can't. Yes, you can. No, I can't. Yes. You can. She got angry with me. Imagine that. 
a woman getting angry. You coward preachers are happy that I said that instead of all of you saying that. Yeah. So she got right here. Now, you know, where I come from, every individual has his own space. Yes, so when you're right here like this, you don't get it, preacher. I want to use my blessed finger and say, back up two feet. You're in my space. Anyways, I said, you can do it. No, I can't. She gets mad. And uh, she actually grabbed my jacket a little bit. She goes, you're not listening to me. I said, what? You're not listening to me. So we're going back and forth. You know, the ushers are coming now. And she goes, how can you say that? I said, oh, darling, this is like the fifth time you've said this to me in the last 10 years. I can't go on. I can't take any more of it. The battle's too much to bear. Number one, that's my first response to you. And here you are tonight. You'll be back next Sunday. Yeah. You're like Peter. You don't know anywhere else to go. You might as well ride this out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Off she went. Come back next Sunday. Uh, she waved at me and smiled. I didn't have to say, are you okay? You know? This is what I do a lot to the church family. Told you so. Didn't I tell you? It's going to be okay. You know? I told you. I told I don't ever, they can, I don't say it. I don't think you're supposed to say it, are you? William, are we supposed to say it? Yeah, we, we, but I always give him the hand and arm signal, you know, yeah. I said, you go make it. Now, here's the three friends that I don't think you can live without them. One, his name is a preacher from Galilee named Jesus the Christ. Yes. Yes. I advise you to make sure that this Jesus is in every area of your life. Yes. Say every. every. That he's in every area. He's here in your church life. He's in your work life. He's in your married, if you're married, married life. He's with your children, parenting them. He's with your children as they grow up. He's in your church. He's in your children's church. He's in your... Uh, I don't think you're going to do very well in these dark, demonic days if you're just going to have met Jesus once and claimed you're okay, or make your walk with God your religion instead of an hour-by-hour hour lifestyle following our Master and inviting Him in everything. Raise your hands to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. His name is Jesus. And say, Jesus, Jesus. I'm going to make sure that you are involved in absolutely every area of my life. Yeah, in Jesus' name. So I challenge you in that. Now, I know you know Jesus. I would think you, you do. If you're not a believer tonight, don't you leave here without praying and asking the Lord to come in your heart. And the leaders will be around here. And through any believer here can just about get you born again. Uh, but I'm really severe about it. I think a lot of people have met Jesus. They've met our music. They've met the pastor. They've met the church. They've met the church people. They met our doctrines, but they've never had a real encounter with the King of Kings, and they don't invite him in everything. Mm. The second friend that I totally, absolutely am convinced that you need is the Holy Spirit, the third or one of the three members of the Trinity. Our God is made up of three persons. We call it Father, Son, Holy Ghost. You don't want to live today without the Holy Spirit guiding you, helping you, revealing to you, listen to this, listen to this, enabling you to be a Christian in the darkest time of your life. There's never been in your lifetime, in my lifetime, there's never been a more dirty, anti-Christ, movement against the church in my whole lifetime 
than there is right now. There is right now. And I, I watch people. I, it hurts my heart to see people that I know met Jesus. I know they mean well. I know they've even been to church. Some of them work in the church, you know, and serve in ministry of helps, and they give. And they, but it hurts my heart to see them not make it because they're getting confused or they're walking away or some demonic spirit cuts in. You know, the book of Galatians says, you, Christian, you were running so well, you are racing Christ. Who, not what, not what, who cut in on you and hindered you from obeying all the truth? In other words, finishing your course. There's a who in your life. There's one in mine. There will always be one as long as there's a devil. Just make sure it's not uh, your doings, like, like Saul and his Amalekite. I think about it all the time, King Saul. He was told by God to go into the enemy camp and kill all the Amalekites, everything. Kill everything. See, this is a part of God that the modernist preachers don't reveal this part of our God. But let's back up the tape a minute. God killed everybody in Noah's day, not the devil. It's called judgment. The devil didn't kill Jesus Christ. God, his father, is a bloody God. And he said, this can't be a little whipping twice with a stick, a spanking. He's going to have to go almost to death. And then death in order to have enough bloodshed, important enough bloodshed to win an entire human race. That's our God. That's our God. Want to raise a hand a minute and just thank him for it? Now, what was I saying before all that? So, this great Holy Spirit wants to, he wants to think about that. So King Saul, why didn't he just obey God? Why can't you and I just obey God? What, what's with that? Now I get it, I get it. I make room for it. Nobody on that end, that side of the resurrection was born again. They had no new nature. They were living under the Adamic nature, the Adam nature, the fallen man nature. The prophets the Spirit of God would come upon them to do a task, but nobody lived with the Spirit of God living in them until, you know, Jesus died. He breathed, John 20, he breathed on those disciples. They became Christians. Later on, the same disciples and others got baptized in what we call baptized in the Holy Ghost. Are you there? Amen. Now, why didn't Saul just obey God? But he didn't. He didn't. The prophet found out about it and he come to see the king. That's how that's supposed to work. That's how it was supposed to work in America. We're a republic. We never should have been a democracy. You know, in its true meaning. A democracy means you go by popular vote. A republic means you go by your documents. The more we go by what the public wants and the vote the farther we seem to walk away from our documents. Yes. But I'm watching the same thing in the church. Yes. 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 The, the more we want to go with what man wants and, 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 uh, and, and the way they think it should be, and I'll go to your church if you change it and dim the lights and make it a nightclub and look in place, and I can wear what I want to, say what I want to, do what I want to. The more we do that, the more we'll walk away from this Bible. Yes. You ought to thank God every day for the forefathers. Because what if they would have changed back in their day? What if they would have said, no, the rules are too hard. No, that's not what modern man wants. They had, they had a modern man in their day. But they didn't. They stuck with that book just like you're sticking with this book. So the future generation still has a hope of truth. Well, Saul disobeyed. Prophet come to see him. The prophet of God, which hardly nobody likes. Even today, the prophet of God comes and says, you have disobeyed your God. The king argued with him. Yes, I have. No, you did not. Yes, I did. No, you didn't. Yes, I did, preacher. 
And the prophet finally had to say, then where did these Amalekite sheep come from that I'm listening to? Yes, sir. And who is this? On his knees chained. Is this not Agag, right. the king yes. of the Amalekites? You were told by God to kill everything right. that would cause you to be ungodly. Right. Yes, sir. And he didn't do it. Right. Yes. Now some time goes by. The preacher killed Agag. Read your Bible. He'd do his sword and cut his head off. Yes, sir. He shouldn't have had to do that. Right. Don't make the preacher do stuff for you you should have done. Yes. I'm preaching really good right now. Yes. It took the preacher to say, no, you don't get to live, buddy. I know, if you think about it, you know, in, in back in my psychology classes and, and philosophy classes, I know why Saul did that when I reminisce what we were talking. He did that because he said, well... If this was turned around and the Amalekites would have won the battle, I wouldn't have wanted him to kill me. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I'm starting to hear that more and more. Well, what if this would have been me? Uh -huh. Well, it shouldn't be you if you obey God. That's right. That's right. The preacher kills Agag. Yeah. Time goes by. Bef before the end of Saul's life, but back at that time, the prophet rebukes the king. He gets mad. And he reaches out and he grabs the preacher. And he tears his garment. And God said, I hope you get this right here. I'm about to tell you something so simple that can literally save your bacon. Okay, maybe you say it different here. Your butt. The prophet turned to him and said, just like you've torn my garment, this kingdom will be torn from you. You know what I notice? I've been preaching a long time. I notice people who turn on the preacher to hurt the preacher, to disassemble the preacher, to accuse falsely, especially the preacher, that never, ever ends up very good for them. I feel bad about that because they, they were good people once upon a time. So, later on in life, Saul's going to lead his army into battle, but the prophet doesn't show. But God's people wouldn't fight in those days without a word from God. But the prophet didn't show up that day. So Saul said, I'll be the prophet. Oh, I hear that all the time. Uh, I'll just be the, I'll be the pastor of my own family. Yeah. We'll just have a family church thing. Uh, I'll be my own prophet. Uh, God bless you, but anybody that I know that's ever done that, honestly, humbly speaking, it didn't turn out so well for them or their family. Right, you see, you can't do this the way you want to, Cain. Right, you have to do it the way God said to. Right, His sons for some reason say, we're standing with the king. Prophet or not, preacher. Who needs a preacher? Yeah, we got King Saul. We don't need no preacher. Yeah. They went into battle and they all died. Saul lost everything. The kingdom, his kids, yeah. his commanders, they all died. Saul was not quite dead. He turned, you know the story, it's in your Bible. He turned to his armor bearer and he said, don't let them capture me. You know, basically, they'll torture me. They'll mock me. You know, eventually, they'll cut my head off and run it through the city. That's what they did on victory parades. Kill me in. I'm dying. I'm not going to make it. Do me in. The armor bearer said, I can't do it. I won't do it. You got to do it, the king says. Please do it. And the armor bearer said, I can't touch God's anointed. Now, he wasn't God's anointed. He just used to be God's anointed. But that was taken from him. Do you know, running the tape forward for a minute, do you know the Bible says Saul died as one who had never been anointed with oil. But he was. Samuel anointed him. God told Samuel to anoint him to be king. 
God, you know, God said to the people, well, if you got to have it, here he is. And God anointed him. So he was anointed, but he died as one who had never been anointed with oil. That's a bad way to die. The armor bearer says, I can't do it. You're, you're God's anointed one. I, he might have said, hey, I was there when Samuel anointed you to be the king. I'm not doing you in. So he turned to the armor bearer on his other side and said, the same story, you got to stop him, do me in quick. Uh, I'm dying anyhow. And he killed him. Grabbed his gears, his, his, his crown and a couple of belongings, his king's wristband, and he ran it up to David. And he said, the king is dead, and so are all those that stood with him, including his own sons. That's why you got to be really wise even today that when, you're, when your family and part of your family don't want to walk with your God anymore, you better choose whether or not you're going to be in that battlefield with them. There's an old saying, you know, blood is thicker than water. And the civilians interpret that as blood meaning blood relatives and water meaning water baptism. But if you're a combat vet, you know what that means. That means you are blood brothers for life. And you didn't know that day if it was water or moisture or, or the man next to you, the blood splattered on your face. And uh, we made, those, those were like blood brother, blood covenants into battle and out of battle. And they're not easily broken. Uh, you know, um, God talked about coming out of your mother's womb. You have to be, you know, born of water and of the Spirit. You have to be birthed as a human in order to be the temple of God. Saul died by an Amalekite. He, David asked him, well, who are you? He goes, I was his armor bearer. Well, what do you mean? He said, I'm an Amalekite. First time I ever read that, I thought, why is there a Malachite even alive? Because Saul, oh, I wish you'd listen to this. Saul took matters in his own hands and decided in his own brain, I'm not going to kill all these Amalekites. Because if he would have, there'd been no King Agag. The kingdom would not have been ripped from Saul. He would have not have died demon-driven, probably demon-possessed. I don't know. And this Amalekite wouldn't have been here to kill him. So I called my pastor, was still alive then, John Osteen. And I called Pastor John. He's in heaven now. And I called Pastor John and I said, I just read this story about Saul and the Amalekite and how he killed the king and and I said, uh, talk to me about that, Pastor. He said, I got one thing to say to you, son. You better make sure you have no Amalekite. And he hung up the phone. Man, I went Amalekite hunting. <laughs> I am not joking, man. I said, well, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. What's an Amalekite? Anything that God told you to get rid of and you decided to keep it? Or you got rid of most of it, but not all of it? I can go deeper. I can go deeper. But so far you like me, and I don't know how much deep. I mean, I got a sharper sword than this, but, you know, I'm running out of time to get you healed before I send you home. Yeah. You don't want to be that guy. All my life I've heard great preaching about Samson. Samson didn't die a hero. He died blind. His eyes were gouged out, gouged out. Not with anesthesia and a nice surgeon. That'd be bad enough. They just gouged him out. Yes. And he went blind. And he worked like a pack mule yep. in a press for who knows. I can't remember how long. But day after 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 day. And then finally his hair grows out. That wasn't Samson keeping any covenant. That was God keeping his covenant. Yeah. Because he had a Nazarite vow. And his hair grew out and his strength came back. Well, they took him out one day in a, in a pagan celebration and chained him to the pillars of the pagan temple. And his hair grew out and he began to feel 
the power of God come and he pulled those pillars, man. And the roof fell and the wall fell and they all died, including Samson. He didn't live. He died blind. There wasn't even a lover there to hold him on his deathbed. He died in the camp of the enemy. All he would have had to do is obey his dad. It's that simple. His daddy said, do not go over there and get a girl from that tribe. Now, wait a minute. Not racial. We're not talking about racial. We're talking about false gods. His daddy knew if you go to that region, they don't serve our God. You don't want to marry a girl that don't serve our God, son. And he went anyways, time and again. He knows this is not a love feast. You don't light the candles and, 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 and have sex and then she calls the enemy to kill you? And, and I mean, Samson might have made a dumb decision, but you got to be like dumb, dumber, and double dumb, <laughs> triple dumb That's to right. think that girl's in love with you. Yeah. He knew he was fooling around. Yeah. But see, the anointing stays for a while. Yeah. I've noticed this. When people pull out of churches, they abandon the preacher. Yeah. They abandoned their call. I'm not talking about being transferred or being sent. I'm talking about just going out and, and, and for a while, you know, it's, it's just like, where's the big bad wolf? He can't huff and puff and blow my house down. But just like Samson, he didn't know the power was waning. His permission from God to function was not there anymore. And what was it, like the third event that we know of? And uh, he went to break those bands. And God just wasn't there that day to help him. Isn't that something? Do you know why you have an Old Testament Bible? I'll tell you a couple of reasons in case, because nobody yelled and answered. But I know you know. One, it's called end samples. Those stories were built over hundreds and hundreds of years. There would not be enough time from the resurrection of Jesus Christ until the trumpet blows to have enough years of God to rebuild all those stories. Wait a minute, wait a minute. And what he thought about it. The thought of God, what God feels about things, can be found in the New Testament, but nowhere's near like what you can feel, the feeling of God in those Old Testament stories. Number two is for you and me to keep looking at and saying, oh, that's how God feels about that. Mm -hmm. That's how God feels about that. Mm -hmm. Lift your hands and say, Lord, I, just help me. I want to know how you feel about everything. Praise God. Help me. Tell me. I want to know how you feel about everything. Come on. Ask him in your own life. Lord, help me in my own life to know. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. So the first friend you're going to need is Jesus Christ. Get him involved in everything. 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 Not just church stuff. Everything. What vehicle you buy. You know, everything. All your money, your house, your marriage, everything. Everything. Because you're not a Christian when you come to church. That's religion. You're a, you're a born-again Christian. That's 24-7. Two, you're going to want this Holy Spirit to guide you through the maze of the last days. We've got to have more Holy Ghost than you've ever had before. Listen. In here to the Holy Spirit. And, and we'll help you. We'll help you, I promise. Because the familiar spirit, you know, he'll come as an angel of light, but he's a ding -a -ling. He's going to make you goofy. Yes, he wants to make you goofy. Yes, sir. Believe goofy stuff, say goofy, prophesy goofy stuff. Don't get me started on that. I think I will for just a minute. Amen. Amen. No one, no one kind of cheered me on, but I felt in my own heart. Amen. You know these stories, of course, but. We were preaching over on the East Coast. And, uh, you know, I haven't 
quite got up to preach yet. I'm a guest speaker. And this lady takes off. You know this story real well. This lady takes off and she gives a, a prophecy. Right? My children, I haven't memorized. My children, my children, I am not here, my children. I'm thinking, well, then who's talking? <laughs> For I have left here and I have written Michelob on the door. Now, you may not know, you pure Christians, that Michelob is a beer. Ichabod is what happens when God leaves. Not the beer, not Michelob. But she said, clearly, I have written Michelob on the door. I thought, I turned to her. She sat down, looked at me for some reason. I turned around and I, I said, goofy. You're nothing but goofy. God God not only doesn't make you goofy he doesn't want you and me to be a bunch of goofballs God makes you stable not unstable the presence of the Holy Spirit makes you pure and clean and stable and decisive not all scrambled eggs you know these people all this oh man told you not to get me started on that. Wow. Yeah. So ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, guide me. Show me. Teach me. He's not going to tell you everything. You know why? He, he knows everything. Sure. You know why he won't tell you everything? Because you already sometimes play God in your own life. Calling your own shots, coming when you want to, leaving when you want to, giving when you want to, not when you don't want to. Sure, some people even, they only forgive when they feel like it. I'll forgive that guy as soon as he repents. I didn't know your name was Jehovah, honey. Yeah. But see, so God, God's not going to tell you everything. Why? He wants you to be dependent yes. on his leadership and keep coming to him so you can walk your life out together. He doesn't want to raise you up and just send you out and say, don't ever talk to me again. He wants to walk with you hand in hand, just like me, all the rest of the days of your life. Amen. I'm preaching pretty good. Amen. If we had a contest in here, whatever the prize is, I'm going to win it because I'm preaching better than you're saying amen. <laughs> Oh, now, now you know I'm closing. Now, now we're getting really activated here, aren't we? Yeah. It's got to be your church, Pastor. Look, I don't know. Is it? Have you taught? Are, you have anybody here with you at all? How many of you came with, with, the, with them? Oh, yeah. How about some amens from over there? Oh, they've been saying amen all along. Well, it ain't your church. You said they better. <laughs> kind of had a feeling about that. I could go on on that because it's so important. But let me go to the third friend you better have. I'm serious. I'm dead serious. You, you better have Jesus Christ in every area of your life. You better be filled with and led by this great Holy Spirit more tight and precise than you ever have. And you better submit and obey and feed off from your pastor. Because there is nobody, I want you to hear me, because some people think it's cultish and wrong. And No, listen to me. God has appointed nobody in your life. Now, I'll give you, if you're like a minor, younger, young person, then your parents, of course, are included. But overall, in Christianity, God appointed shepherds yes. to feed the flock, guard the flock. Yes. That's why Hebrew says, submit. Yep. And That's not a cuss word. Submit and obey them that have the rule over you. So that's not just everybody in leadership. That's your pastor. That's your pastor that has a governing stick over you. All right? Uh, and it says, uh, submit to them, for they are those who watch over your soul. Or you could say, as you work out your salvation. They're your greatest witness for Book of Hebrews. For they are those who must give an account. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Then it says, do not make this a grief. Right. You're staring at me. Do I got to read it to you? Yes, 
you know them. The, no, no, this, uh, the Bible says, New Testament, oh, you don't want to make it a grief. Do, let me, let me modernize it. Do not be a grief to him. Why, I tell people sometimes, why are you giving me grief? I'm not the devil, I'm not your problem. You, you're aiming, you're shooting arrows at the wrong guy. Yeah, it says, make sure it's not a grief for your pastor to pastor you. Because it goes on to say, that will not be profitable for you. So you better have Jesus Christ all over your life. You better have the great Holy Spirit guiding you like never before, anointing you like never before. And you better have a good pastor. Thank God, uh, these preachers I know, I can't vouch for every preacher, but I can the ones I know. I'll vouch for these preachers. And uh, they don't quit, don't you? They don't quit. They don't quit. And they're not afraid of humans. And they're not man pleasers. And they love you. How do you know, Doc? Why would they put up with you if they didn't? Why? You, think about it for a minute. Now, I know a lot of you are sweet little, be- little blue ribbon sheep. But look in the mirror next time you have an a attitude day. And just say, thank God for pastor. He doesn't run me out of the church. Next time you bring your crud in here on a church service and it doesn't make it to the altar, if it makes it to the altar, we're glad. Come in ugly, leave pretty. But just come in ugly and an attitude and and, and stirring up things and then you leave that way, you know we love you or we wouldn't let you back in next service. One time a lady told me, she said, "Uh, you know, there's just hardly any love. How would she say it? Uh, there's hardly any love in this church. I said, oh, darling. Oh, my, 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 my. Do you know how much love is exercised just to put up with you? (laughs) I was serious. She was a brat. There are church brats. Trying not to look around. Actually, I'm looking at everybody right now. I don't know why. (laughs) There goes my offering again. (laughs) I said, honey, you know how much love it takes to keep you in this church? You're not, you're not easy, doll. You're mouthy. You're sassy. You have attitudes. I mean, you know, every time we want to do something, you're bucking the system. You got something to say about it. And, and then, you, then when you say, I'm in support, then someone tells me, you posted some ding dumb thing on kindergarten Facebook. Yeah. I should say D-Facebook. And, uh, it takes a lot of love to keep you, honey. So don't ever say again, there's no love here. There's plenty of love here. Amen. 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 See, that's a lie of the devil. Yes, sir. Well, you know, uh, pastor looked right at me during that really tough part of the sermon. I had people tell me that before. I said, listen, I want to help you. I love you. Stop flattering yourself. You're not that important, honey. I didn't stay up all night to make a message just for you. I'm sorry that that really busts your bubble, but I come to feed the whole flock. So no, no, it wasn't all made up just to go after you, right? Right? But sometimes I feel like saying, of course I was staring at you. I'm a skillful communicator. Yes. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, there goes the rest of my offering. <laughs> it's, good, it's, good thing I got no, it's good thing I got enough gas to get home. Praise <laughs> God. Oh, so, listen. I will close, but listen. Don't let... Uh, don't let anybody or anything mess you up between you and your preacher. That's right. Don't do it. It's not worth it. We, listen, we know we're not perfect. There are no perfect humans. We know that. You know what else we know? We know when we shoot a dud. You know what a dud is? A big bang, regular bullet, a lot of powder, uh, but no projectile. Bang! Falls right there. You don't have to come up and tell us we didn't do good. 
We know that before we close our Bible. There's been times I've closed my Bible and, and wanted to say, this ain't coming out good, folks. I'll see you next Sunday. We don't need you to be the, the, the notifier. Huh? Why do I always start really preaching good right when I'm out of time? I don't know. Some of you are ducking. You know, there are church duckers. Yes, they are. Now, I've been watching some of you tonight. I swing, you know, and you go. <laughs> Try again, preacher. You didn't get me this time. Praise <laughs> God. Father, bless us to serve you. We need friends. We're going to need our, if we're married, we're going to need the friendship of our husband and wife. And our kids are going to need their parents. And we're going to need a David and a Jonathan. And so the list goes on. But I believe, I really believe, Lord, the three most important friends anybody can have is you, Jesus, all through their life. The great guidance and anointing of the Holy Spirit. And a pastor that's not afraid of me. He loves me. They love me. She loves me. They're not afraid of me. They're not a man pleaser. And even at the risk of losing me or me throwing a tantrum or getting offended, they're still going to tell me the truth. Lord, I don't think we need to pray for you. Holy Spirit, I don't think we need to pray for you. But I think we ought to close praying for all good pastors everywhere. Lord, I thank you. I pastored all these years, Master. I don't know why anybody would volunteer for this job. I don't know why we, we just keep going because we're called. But there's beautiful Christians, and we love every one of them. We even love the brats, but Lord, they make our job hard. And I pray for Pastor in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. They have backbone, and they have courage, they have truth, they have anointing, and they love us. They absolutely put up with us. And they'll pick us back up again. And I thank you. Bless them in Jesus' name. Now, one last thing. If you're the head of your household. Now, according to the Bible, New Testament, if you're married, biblically, the husband is a male and the Wife is a female. This is God's way. And you have holy matrimony. But the man, the husband, according to the New Testament, is supposed to be the head of that household. Why? Because he's the one that's going to have to give the greatest account. Therefore, he bears the most responsibility. Therefore, he, he uh, has the power of choice and, and answer for it later. I've, uh, I've been married uh, 53 years, and uh, I tell Vicki all the time, I, I've watched you all our life. I met her at 13. I watched you all our life when we dated, when we got married, my time at the, in the war, you know, my, all of these years in ministry. I've learned something. I tell her this. I've learned something, Vicki. It takes more courage and more character to follow than it does to lead. Now, it, it isn't always leading that's so easy. Now, there's some men, they're tormented by a rebellious wife. They're tormented by a worldly, you know, a woman in their life. So it isn't always easy to raise kids and be responsible to make the decision. But it is our duty. It is God's way. But sometimes through death, maybe you're a widow, that would make you lady, friend, the head of your household under Christ. Maybe you've been divorced or ditched. Uh, maybe it wasn't death, but you're still, maybe you never, maybe you're a single. Uh, maybe you've never been married yet. There's different things that cause this. So here's what I'm going to do before I sit down. God told me today to pray over all of the heads of households. So that would be all you men who are married Single, father or not. Because even if you're single living alone, you're in charge of your household. Whether it's a tent, an apartment, or a house. And then all of you ladies, not, not, not because you want to be, not because your husband isn't, but because you've inherited this head of the household place, 
you all stand up. Heads of households. Father, I pray right now, just like you're instructing me, I pray that we will put our foot down. We are the filter to stop filth and, uh, and all this anti-Christ, anti-God stuff from seeping into our lives, our homes. We say no. And we even got to monitor now television, computers, watches, you know, telephones, cell phones, and everything else that opens a window to the whole world that we are governing our household and keeping out all the demons and all of Satan. I thank you, Lord. Bless us with money to take care of our household and our families. And bless us with the greatest anointing we've ever known. Give us Holy Ghost discernment to see and to know. To see and to know what to do next. Thank you for helping every one of us. In the name of Jesus, say amen. amen. I sure love you. Thanks for having me again, Chris, and putting this together. And uh, you're a great church. Don't blow it now, okay? That's for you too. Uh, for you too, William. For you too, Caleb. I love you. Give the Lord a good hand clap. Come on, come on, Chris. Amen. Clap real good. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Father, we thank you for this meeting tonight. We thank you for the